First Timothy chapter 6 in our Bibles, if you would please, tonight. This morning, I, uh, of course, opened with this passage of Scripture, and I never even really got to it till the end. I got out there where there was a point of no return. Just started talking, and I realized the time had gone by, and I was just uh, wasn't going to get to where I wanted to go. But thank you for your patience. Thanks for being back tonight. I sure love you and appreciate your faithfulness. I see Sunday school teachers and uh, faithful nursery workers who are busy this morning, security guards who are doing putting out cones and helping people get to places and keeping peace in Jerusalem that are here tonight. Thank you for that. Those on the medical team and people helping us in different uh, facets of the ministry. Thank you for your faithfulness. Ushers, I appreciate you. Looking forward to hosting our friends next week. I hope you'll be uh, ready to go to be a help and a blessing. And uh, we want to encourage you to be a part of that. The book of 1 Timothy is one I'm very familiar with. I remember getting off the phone uh, sitting at my uh, breakfast counter in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 87, uh, 1887, uh, Lombard Avenue. The phone rang, and it was a deacon of a church, in First Baptist Church of Long Beach. And he said, Brother Wilkerson, tonight our church has voted 97% for you to be our pastor. And uh, we believe that you are supposed to be the 16th pastor of the First Baptist Church of Long Beach would you consider being our pastor? Now, I already knew that at that time, that was probably what the Lord wanted for me to do. But I remember telling him, yes, and we'll work on coming to be your pastor. I was scared. I was nervous. I was 32 years old. Didn't know exactly what would be my future. I knew there was lots of problems. They had been 13 months without a pastor, and they had gone through a very difficult, low time. Everybody who wanted to leave did, and it was just a few handful of people in a 13, 1400 seat auditorium uh, in English. I thought about that whole situation when I hung up and we prayed together. I thought to myself, I'm a pastor now. What do pastors need to do? I've had the greatest pastors of all time in my life from the time I was a little boy until that very moment I had a great pastor, Brother Spencer. But uh, I thought to myself, now I'm a pastor of a church. I began thinking about the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And so in my mind, I thought, you know what? If those are the pastoral epistles, then I'm going to try to read them. And I began on a quest to read them every week. Six chapters in 1 Timothy, four chapters in 2 Timothy, and three chapters in Titus. And I began to read them. I didn't try to memorize them. I just read them and thought about them. And uh, I, I probably, I don't know the Bible like I should, but if I did know three books of the Bible, it would probably be 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And uh, I'm not the pastor I want to be or the pastor that you deserve, but if I've learned anything about pastoring, I've probably learned it in those three books. I have a lot more to learn. But I think about Paul as he wrote Timothy. He wrote to him. And uh, Paul is uh, in prison, and he writes to Timothy. He's probably in his first imprisonment in Rome. And Timothy, he's told him, I want you to stay at Ephesus. It was a key church. He had been there three years himself to start the church. It would be one of the churches of Asia Minor in the book of the Revelation. And it was a key church. They had lost their, left their first love. You might remember that. But it was a church that Paul loved them very much. He ministered to them on his third missionary journey. He met with all the pastors there out on the seashores of Miletus, where they had come back and stopped the boat there, and he had them come in to, to see him. He told them, that's where he told them, it's more blessed to give than to receive. He gave them the challenge to, to uh, watch out for false doctrine coming in. He told them about uh, their, his, their need to be all that God wanted to be as leaders. And now he writes to Timothy, and he says, I'm going to write to you because I want to get out of jail and come to where you are. But if it takes me a long time to get there, if I tarry long, I want you to know how to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Most of our college students would know these six principles. But each chapter has a major theme, sound doctrine, chapter 1. A walk with God and prayer is a priority in chapter 2. Chapter 3, he challenges him to spiritually reproduce himself, to not leave until he has trained pastors and people who would help their pastor. By the way, all of you, if you're a bus captain, train another bus captain. If you're a Sunday school teacher, train another Sunday school teacher. If you work in the nursery, get someone else to work in the nursery with you. 
and, and train another but nursery worker. All of us ought to. There's no success without successors. I think about this for this church, and I'm, I'm asking the Lord to help us. I don't know how long I'll get to be your pastor. I hope I'm an old man when I have to step aside and no longer can give you the strength of my youth. I want somebody else to come up, and I want someone else to come and know what to do. I want a handoff. I don't want to fumble. I want to be able to hand it off to somebody with your help. Obviously, I can't choose my successor. That'll be your job, but I hope the obvious successor will be, uh, will be what the Spirit of God wants. And I think about that, and I hope you'll pray about that. Because this church does not belong to me. It's never one day been my church. It is the Lord's church. It is His job to oversee it. But it's my job to somewhat manage it under His direction. And I've had my issues there, and you pray for me, but I love this church. I want it to be, I want to foster long beyond the life and times of John Wilkerson if the Lord doesn't come back. But all of us need to be continue reproducing. That's what chapter 3 is about. Chapter 4 is about being a good example. Is about, is about not, no man despise you, but be an example. Chapter 5 is about relationships and the responsibilities that are there. Whether it be with the older men or older women, younger men, younger women, or the widows or the pastors, or just how to monitor ongoing relationships, Paul tells Timothy in chapter 5 to do that. And then in chapter 6, he speaks of financial management. He tells Timothy, Timothy, you've got to learn to handle finances. And he gives him four main principles. One of those is to work diligently, to be a hard worker for a saved boss, for an unsaved boss. He tells him to associate carefully. Be careful who you spend time with. Not everybody is good for you. Some people that you have friends with, they are always got an angle. They're always the get-rich-quick thing. They've always bought into every single uh, thing that gets money fast, and they want to pull you into that. Be careful about that. Be careful about those who don't questions. They throw out questions like, well, we don't get paid enough. Money. How much are you getting paid? Well, yeah, see, they don't really appreciate us. That guy that stands around hold up styles around the water cooler, get away from him. The person that's critical of the boss, the person who doesn't work, the person who's lazy, the one who cuts corners. The Bible says you got someone like that who's just flapping the soup coolers instead of working. Get away from him. Withdraw yourself from him. In doing so, you're going to help your financial security. You'll be more blessed if you will work diligently, be careful who you spend time with at the job. And then he says, I want you to live simply. No when enough is enough. If you have food and raiment, be content. Don't get into this place of having to have this and that and the other. We live in a very materialistic society where, where we feel like a, a man's life consists of the things that he can have. And God put with all, within all of us a desire to do, a desire to have, and a desire to be. That is all, that is, that's natural inside of us, but it must be balanced with a spiritual mechanism. You know, if we didn't have a desire to do something, we'd all be just a bunch of blobs. Okay, God put us in inertia inside of us to do, to have. It's not wrong to work hard, and even the Scripture will see, to enjoy the fruit of a man's labor. If you work hard, God is going to bless you. When he blesses you, you can enjoy that. But don't fall in love with the gift at the expense of the giver. Don't become, don't, uh, you know, or, uh, uh, don't become so enthralled with materialism. If God gives you a little more, your giving should be a lot more. We oftentimes think when God gives us more, then I'll raise my standard of living. Then I'll get this, and I'll buy this, and I'll get more. And God wants to raise your standard of giving. He wants to use you, but we want to be a bucket instead of a channel. We want to be a, we want to be a, a, a recipient instead of a funnel. And God wants to use us, and he tells Timothy, listen, work diligently. Associate carefully. Evaluate, evaluate your associations. And then be simple. Have simple taste. This, this life is not your final home. You're in here just to, the Bible tells another passage of Scripture, you want to have a warfare mentality. 
Soldiers who go overseas do not take their entertainment center with them. They don't take all their model airplanes with them. They don't take all their, their Xbox with them. That's not on their mind. They go over there with enough to get in there to get the job done and get home. And to some extent, God wants his people that way. We get so caught up with possessions, and possessions have a tricky way of possessing us, of holding us down and, and learning to know when enough is enough. And, and, and I'm not talking about making yourself poor. I'm talking about making yourself rich forever. And then he tells him there's another concept that you need to take into consideration. Yes, hard work. Yes, careful associations. Yes, simple living. But make sure you get a hold and challenge God's people with generous giving, with giving aggressively. And I do not know, I do not know where you are, and this is not to, to poke anybody in the eye. I'm just going to, we're going to walk through this pastor's scripture. If the shoe fits, you wear it. But I would say that normally it is the Lord who challenges us. In the most uh, unbelievable sermon ever preached, it was preached by the Lord Jesus Christ. You can begin reading it in Matthew chapter 5. It will go to Matthew chapter 7. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And he begins by saying, blessed are they, blessed are they, blessed are they. And he'll preach a message that's three chapters of your Bible, and it's an unbelievable message. It will end with God saying, okay, you're either going to hear it and do it, or you're just going to hear it. If you hear it and you do it, you're like a man or a woman who builds his house on a rock. And when the difficulties come, you will have obeyed, and God will let your, your rock, your, your house stand. If you just hear it, then you're going to be like a man who, or a woman who goes out and builds their house on a sand. And when the storms come and the floods come and the, and the ocean waves come, they will wash away the foundation. And uh, you, you, you'll have a much suffer, you'll suffer loss. Well, with that in mind, God now tells, tells Timothy through the Apostle Paul and to us, here are some suggestions about generous giving. Let's look at verse 17, can we please? I like the other parts of the passage of Scripture. It focuses on Jesus and the previous verses, and I love listening to who he is. And let's look real quick at verse 16. Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach, and to whom no man hath seen nor can see, uh, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Then he gives him this challenge. Charge. Now, the word charge, uh, it means to admonish strongly or fervently. It would be kind of like a military sergeant talking to a private. He's given him a charge. He's telling him, get in here. Let's get this done. Come on now. This is not a, just a suggestion like pat him on the head and tell him, well, you might want to think about doing this. He said, look. Charge those that are rich in this world. He said, I want you to be able to tell people this with some confirmation, with some, with the, with some uh, confidence, and some fervor. Look, if you would, please, at verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world. Now, I'm going to tell you this, as I told you this morning, that really is everybody in this room. When God thinks of it, now, some of us are, have a little bit more than others, and I don't know who that is and it doesn't matter to me. I hope this is, just, this is helpful to everybody. But the truth of the matter is, if God gave you more, he expects more. But all of us, we have more than we need. Every one of us, we throw away food. If you want something, you get it. We have plenty of luxuries that we enjoy. God has given us more than we need. And that is usually a good definition of rich in the Bible. We think of rich like Bill Gates. God thinks of rich like you and me. We have more than we actually need. And if God gives you more than you need, the Bible says, let him that stole steal no more, but rather work with his own hands that which is good so they can have to give to them that need it. If God gives you more than you need, it's usually to, to share. 
Now, money is something that is to be given, is to be saved. There's some there's effort to save, and that's that's a beautiful concept. The Bible says there is oil and treasure to be desired in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man spendeth it all up. Okay? So if you don't have any savings, you probably need to exercise some wisdom from God and put away some savings. Now, here's the problem, is we do not know how much is enough. And it's very easy for us to start trusting money, or think we are. And that's where it gets a little bit squirrely on our thinking. And we start thinking, well, I don't know how much I'm going to need, you know, in this lifetime. I've had people tell me, you know, Pastor, when I die, whew, man, God's going to get a lot for missions. And the truth of the matter, what they're doing, they're saying, you know, you know when if, I, if I don't need it anymore in my life, then I'll go ahead and die and I'll just give it to missions. But the truth of the matter is God wants to do some of our giving while we're living so we're knowing where it's going. God says, I want to reward you for the deeds done while in your body. I'm not so sure that there is a plethora of rewards for people who give after they die. I think it's wise. I plan to include the Lord's work in my, in my will. I want to do that. I think every Christian ought to think about that. And I think you ought to be careful about those things. But I think I want to do that. I, want every, I would want to make sure that when I die, that I am able to give to the Lord. But I want to do most of my giving where I'm, while I'm living. Because God said, I want you to give an account of the deeds done while you were sucking air in your body. While you were functioning there. And, and Paul tells Timothy, as a pastor, you need to charge God's people with these these principles. Let's look at them real quickly, and I'm just going to go through them, and then we'll conclude tonight. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. Okay? So he said, the first thing, if you've got more than you need, sometimes it makes you proud. It makes your mind higher than somebody else. You wouldn't do certain things. Why? Because you, you've got more money than someone else has. God's given you more money, and oftentimes, uh, the, the more wealth we have, the more condescending we are in our mentality, and the more proud, pride hides, but it definitely prides, hides in the heart of someone who has a little bit more. You can see that when you go to McDonald's. If you see that, you see a poor person, you see a wealthy person, the wealthy person, oftentimes, a little bit more hurt. Hey, you want things to happen right now? Come on, don't mess this up again. You know what makes them do that? Pride. He said, if you are, if you have more than you need, charge them, Timothy, that the church family, and he's talking to the church family, not talking about going out and talking to Donald Trump, going out and talking to rich people in the community. He's talking about the, within the body of believers. He said, charge the members of a church who have more than they need not to let it go to their head where they become prideful. There's one sin that God despises probably beyond any other, and that is pride. And there's something about having some money in your bank account, and a thicker wallet, and a thicker purse than someone else that makes you a little more confident. I'm that way, you're that way. You can always tell when I'm broke. <laughs> it affects my body language. If I got a little bit of money, hey, man, we're doing good, man. You could probably tell. I'm a little more jovial, a little happier. I got options, man, hey. But if I don't have any money, the poor use this in treaties. <laughs> they, 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 they're careful with their words. I had someone come to me today, and he said, hey, hey Pastor, uh, can I talk to you in private? Sure. What do you need? Pastor, you got any extra money? I'm going to be moving shortly, but I need some money right now. And so, you know why? He didn't come to me and say, hey, give me, give me the money. No, he just, Pastor, do you mind if we just talk a little bit? Sure appreciate you. But can you have any little money I could have? And I was able to give some money to him. I'm glad to do that. But at the same time, he wasn't, he wasn't bold. He wasn't bold. He was careful. He was intrigued. Why? Because I had money he didn't. And he says, be careful. It doesn't go to your head. Look at the next thing he says. Number one, not be high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. Life has a way of whether you're wealthy or you're poor, 
Uh, things can happen very quick that can change that quickly. Look, if you would please take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 23, would you? Proverbs chapter 23. I feel like this is a good verse that you ought to underline in your Bible. Can I hear those pages turning? Proverbs chapter 23. This is a good verse to underline in your Bible. And I want you to read it with me, if you would, please. Proverbs 23, verse number 5. Are you ready? Let's read it together. 23, 5. Ready? Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? So he says here, and then look at verse number four, labor not to be what? Rich. Cease from mine own wisdom. Boy, oftentimes, folks, we can get ourselves in a bunch of mess here, and we'll set our eyes on that which is not, because riches have a way of, they talk to you, they say goodbye. <laughs> Very quickly. They leave you. And there's something that God says. He says, so tell the people in the church, Brother Pastor Timothy, that be careful if you got more than you need, that it doesn't go to your head and makes you a proud person and makes you think about life revolving around you. Number two, don't put your trust in uncertain up and down finances. Here's something if you just have a think for a moment, money is not static. The stock market, they, they, all day long, they're telling you, up this, the Dow's up, the, the, the NASDAQ, it's up, it's down, it's this. They are all kinds of things. You know why? Because that's the nature of finances. On, the, on New, York, New York Stock Exchange, it's that way. In Japan, Tokyo, it's that way. In Europe, it's that way. In Brussels, it's that way. The worldwide and in your own life, it's that way. It goes up and down, up and down. It's feast and famine, it's up and down. He said, that's why you don't put your trust. What is it about Jesus we know? He is the same. He's your steady. He said, guard, if you've got more than you need, be careful that it doesn't go to your head and cause you to be a proud, self-focused individual. Number two, be careful that you don't put your trust in uncertain riches. It's foolish. Okay, look at the next one the Bible says. He says, but... I want you to put your trust in the three times, I believe, in 1 Timothy. It talks about the living God. God wants us to know that he's not dead. I can hear Miss Belinda Castile or Miss Belinda Gayona saying, God's not dead. No, he is alive. And see that, that clap there. And I think about that. God is not dead. He is alive. He's the living God. Trust in him. Then look at the next thing. It says, who giveth us richly all things for what reason? Now, this is where God asks for balance, okay? Is it okay to have a great meal with your family? Yes. Is it okay to buy a beautiful dress for Easter or for a special day? Yes. God gives us more for us to enjoy. But that's where we have to be tempered by carefulness. Okay? Some people, their whole thought process is, is to enjoy. Every day is a party day. All they can think about is the next weekend away, the next vacation, the next trip, the next uh, the rendezvous, the next thing we're going to do together with the family. It's all about the next thrill. Now, you are given things to enjoy, but that is not your only reason for that. We find in Ecclesiastes, it's good for a man to work and enjoy the fruit of his labor. I don't think you should starve yourself the rest of your life. No. If God blesses you, you'll have times. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. And he had no sorrow to it. If you honor the Lord and his principles, he will honor you. You say, Pastor, see if you say, you're the pastor of this church. I'm telling you, I could say that when I was 17 years old. God was good to me when I was 17 and started giving to the Lord. He was good to me when I was 18, when I was 19, when I was 20. When I took my first position teaching school, $8,000 a year to, to teach 42 young people in 5th and 6th grade, God was good to me then. He met my needs. He helped me. He loved me. He encouraged me. All these years, God had let me to stay out of debt except for a house payment, buying our cars for cash, and I have been able to do things before I was ever a pastor of a church, I never got out of the country until I was 34 years old. I traveled my first missions trip to Panama, and then to South Africa, and since then I've been many places. 
But I'm telling you, friends, that God has been very good to me. He has blessed me to give me lots of things to enjoy. And a lot of things that you and I will enjoy at the hand of God, you'll do it for free. God will bless you to do things. And he said, I want you to enjoy. He said, but don't put your trust in the riches. Put your trust in the living God who gave you that so you can enjoy it. And you know what? Part of enjoying what God's given you is something that Paul goes back to that he talked to the, to the, the Ephesian elders about. It's more blessed to what? You know, there's something about joy of giving. I think I rehearsed that this morning, but one of our young men led a, uh, three kids to Christ yesterday, talked to the mom, and at the end, he said, you know what, can I, can I do anything to help you? And they said, well, you know what, we do need a little bit of groceries. And one of our teenagers went inside, slid his card, purchased uh, ba several bags of groceries, gave it to them, and came back and told them, you know what, it feels good to do that. Felt better for him to do that than it was for him to eat a bowl of Fruit Loops. Feed one person, he got, to help, he got to help a family of four. And there's something about giving that causes you to have joy too. But let's look at the next verse, if you would, please. And this is right out of the Scriptures. He says, verse number 18. He says, I want you to charge those who have more than they need that they do good. Okay, now let me just say this real quickly. He's going to say be good works later on, but he said, I want, when you see the word good in the Bible, it usually means that they be generous. Remember the, the, the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. And then it goes on to long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. Goodness means to give. Naturally, I'm not a giver. Naturally, none of us are givers. Now, it might be part of our, of our, our DNA that God puts inside of us, but naturally, we're takers. And God puts that inside of us to learn to do that. He said, now, you charge the rich that they be good. Now, here's something that some people happen after a while. They don't want to get involved. They just want to pay for others to do. And God still expects people that have means to do something. If you're not careful, we'll get into a place where, you know what, we're just so used to signing checks, sending, sending routing numbers, and we're willing to give this, we're willing to pay, but we're not willing to participate. And the challenge here, he says, you charge the, the rich that they do good, that they give. And I want you to notice the next thing he says there, that they be rich in what? Works. That they do good works, that they do those things which are good. I tell you, I thank God for people who will drive a bus who make $100,000 a year. People who will be a bus captain who make multiple, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars, and yet they'll still be on a bus route. They'll still teach a Sunday school class. They'll still watch little children. They'll still do the things. Even though God has blessed them, they humble themselves to do good works. He says, Timothy, you charge them. Don't let the money go to their head. Let them, let them be not high-minded. Remind them of the responsibilities and make sure that they don't trust in uncertain riches, but they trust and have a relationship with the living God who gives them all things to enjoy. And then he tells them, I want you to make sure that they do good, that they use their gifts, their extra, for good, and they're not neglecting of good works themselves. Look at the next verse. The Bible says, and ready to distribute and, to, and willing to communicate. In the Bible... The Bible tells us distribute means to hand out, to invest. Had someone text me this afternoon and said, Pastor, I believe God's giving me some extra money. Is there something, a ministry in the church, you think that could use this? And if you want to give me a couple of them, I would help me in case there's something God wants me to do. Well, that's, that's good. You know what that, that person says? You know, where can I distribute my excess? What can I do? What is the most, what is the most, most advantageous way to do that? I think it's a wise thing to ask. It's a wise thing to seek. They're, they're ready to distribute. Now, they could take that money and they could use it for themselves or they can divide it out and try to get it to other people. And then to communicate. The word communicate does not mean talking back and forth in the Bible. What it does mean, and you can see it in Galatians chapter 6, is talking about an exchange. If someone helps you spiritually, you help them physically. It is an exchange. So let, let them look to be a help and to a blessing to people that need their help. Then look at the, you would please, the next thing, if I can, please. Laying up in store, verse 19. Read it with me, would you please? 
laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. That's a mouthful, but let me just tell you what it says. It's repeating something Jesus said, laying up in store for themselves. And I want you to notice the, the next thing, a good what? Remember, remember right in the middle of that Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in chapter 6, verse number 19, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Because we all have two perspectives. We have two treasuries, and we have two masters. Every one of us, our vision is either thinking about the nasty now and now, or the next 30 years or the next 30 million years. Okay, your eyes and my eyes are either looking eternally at things or we're looking temporally at things. You got a girl that's messing around and not doing a good job at your waitress. You can, get all, you can cloud up and rain all over her, but you might want to see her more than just serving a meal. She is an eternal soul that's going to go to heaven or hell one day. Because I want you to think you have two visions. The eye, is, if you, the, it talks about the light of the body, is the... Okay. I don't know what your vision's like, but I know I can be extremely temporal in how I see things. God wants me very eternal in how I think, see things. He says, look, you've got two ways to look at life, every one of us, temporal or eternal. Number two, we have two treasuries. You have one here, you have a bank account here, and you have one in heaven. You have, and there's a secret about banking, you only have money when you make deposits. Okay? If you want money in your bank here, you have to keep making the deposits in there. If you want money in your internal bank, you have to keep making deposits. Now, I have never been to heaven, and you haven't either. And everyone who writes a book about it, they haven't either. Okay? But someone lives there, and his name is God. And his son said this, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You read your Bible and you'll see many references and provocation from the God of the Bible telling you, you better think about eternity. Now, you don't have to do anything to go to heaven. Your eternal destiny is fixed by faith. But your rewards and your eternal deposits are made by service and faith and works. That's what we get, that's what, we do. That's, what, that's what goes and transitions over eternity's window. So we have two ways to look at things, two bank accounts, one here, one there, and then we have two masters. And in the context, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, no man can serve two masters. And he's talking about the two masters being mammon, possessions, and God. Because he will gravitate to the one and he'll despise the other. You can't serve. And the way God has wired us to love him and for him to have our heart is to give toward him. Many people, they're not faithful and they're giving to the Lord. And by the way, can I just say this? People who give systematically give more substantially. If you're just a hit and miss, you're missing. If you just give occasionally, oh, you know, I've got a little bit here, I've got a little bit there, you're not, you're not going to be faithful as you would be if you give systematically. And learn to evaluate that. But he says here, he says, laying up for themselves. He said the rich can lay up for themselves a good foundation, back to Matthew chapter 7, that will not get washed away, will not get burned up by fire one day at the judgment and evaluation of God but will stand through the difficulties and the judgment of God. Look, if you would please, verse 17. Against the time to come. What time is that? That's the judgment seat of Christ. Now, you don't know how much I make. I don't know how much you make. We don't know how much each other make. And that doesn't really matter. There's one that knows, and that's God. He knew how much Ananias and Sapphira brought in Acts chapter 5. They did not fool God. He said, what in the world? You're going to lie to the Holy Ghost? You're not going to fool the Lord. He knows, and he knows what you get. He knows your, 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 our excuses. They won't hold up to God. God's laid the same foundational truths to everybody, and then he's given others of us more to give. And oftentimes our failures 
in this financial area are oftentimes our fault, not God's. Now, God will use things different ways. But he says, you tell the rich man, tell those who have more than they have to lay up for themselves a foundation that is sure in heaven. And this is why, look at the last part of this verse, verse number nine, that they may lay hold on what? Okay, and that is living for eternal purposes. That's not how people get to heaven. They don't get to heaven by giving to the church. That means that they will take hold of eternal values. And there is something about the financial investment giving principle that changes your heart and causes you to have a heart for God and a heart for eternity when you learn to give to the Lord. I believe these verses are as powerful. I would just encourage you. I think I've done a lousy job today explaining this, but I'd like to encourage you to take time to read 1 Timothy chapter 6, 17, 18, and 19. Evaluate them in your life. Say, Pastor, I don't even have a job right now. You need to study those verses. Well, I've got a multi-million dollar business. You need to study those business. Well, I'm retired. I'm on, a, I'm on a fixed income. You ought to study those verses. And you ought to make some adjustments in how you're doing things and say, God, what do you want me to do? Because I promise you, you'll be glad you did or wish you would have one day. You'll remember these, these, that Sunday night sermon. You'll remember the challenge that God put in your heart. Because you only have one life to live. You're in the parentheses of life. You're in your vapor. I'm in my vapor right now. And i got to decide what I'm going to do, whether it's a lot or a little, whatever you think and compared to everybody else doesn't really matter. Whatever God's given you, you might want to decide, what am I supposed to do with it? Number one, don't get proud. Number two, don't trust in riches. It's a lousy God. It's a good master, but it's a lousy, it's a good, it's a good slave, but a lousy master. Don't trust in it. Do good. Stay participating. Stay involved in good works. Be ready to distribute, ready to communicate in the work of the Lord. Help them that need the help. Distribute to people that God puts in you, whether it be by tithes or offerings or alms. And then keep an eternal mindset. Lay hold on eternal life because it is good for you. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter when he challenges the Corinthian believers to give to the faith promise plan, he says to them, herein I give you my advice, for this is expedient for you. It wasn't for him. Jesus is not saying, lay up for me treasures in heaven. You give so I can have. Jesus is saying, lay up for you. He said, tell the rich Timothy that they will lay up for themselves an eternal foundation that they'll hold on to eternal values.